Greetings, my students, my prospective students, and my viewers in general. I am Jide Onich House, the Corrective Professional Use of English Lecturer worldwide. I say worldwide because I know all over the world there is no way this kind of program is taking place. Not at all. This I know. I'm not a native speaker of English, but I know the rules, the rules of the sound system, of the grammar, and on the vocabulary, that is the lexis and others. I know this very well, but I'm not a native speaker of English. So eventually, all over the world, even native speakers of English will come and join this program. So the Ben Medin lecture that was heard a couple of weeks ago, I stopped at a particular topic, that's syntactic ambiguities, which is structural multiple interpretations to some statements. So I mentioned one, that is one of the points there, a question that arose, that the lady was married by her cousin. That sentence, as I said, is capable of two different interpretations. The lady was married by her cousin. The first meaning, the cousin was instrumental to the marriage of the lady. That cousin had in marrying the lady to her husband. Another meaning that can be derived from that sentence, which is the lady was married by her cousin, is that the cousin himself married the lady. That is, he took the lady to himself for a wife. So these are the two different interpretations we can give to that statement. We have uh, another one here which is very interesting. One of the boys who robbed yesterday is here. That sentence is capable of two different interpretations. But there is something interesting about it. That is, when you listen to the way it is read, the sentence is read, you'll be able to know the two interpretations. If there are commas in the sentence, then the meaning must change from when there, is, there are no commas. So let's see. One of the boys, comma, who robbed yesterday, comma, is here. In this case, there is a comma before who. Whenever there is a comma between a noun and the relative pronoun, that is the pronoun who, for example, is no more for that noun. That comma has isolated them. So in this case, one of the boys, comma, who robbed yesterday. In this case, the who robbed yesterday is no more for the boys, but one of the boys, the old stretch of, of, of sentence there, of the clause, one of the boys, one of the boys is a phrase, is a noun, noun phrase. So the old noun phrase, the who stands for the old noun phrase. One of the boys, comma, who, the who is for one of the boys. So one of the boys, comma, who robbed yesterday, he said, it means it is one of the boys who robbed the boys, all the boys did not rob. It's just one of the boys who robbed, and the boy is here. But where there is no comma after uh, boys, we just have one of the boys who robbed yesterday is here. One of the boys who robbed yesterday is here. The who stands for the boys. Who robbed stands for the boy. That means the boys robbed. All the boys robbed. And one of them is here. So we can see the two interpretations here. 
Then there's another example here that, but that is under the syntactic ambiguities. I stood before John. I stood before John. In this case, there are two meanings that we can derive from it, the sentence. One, I stood. John also stood. But I did this before he did before he stood. I stood before he stood. I, I was the first to stand. I stood before John. I stood before John stood. That's one meaning. The second meaning is I stood facing John. That is, I stood in front of John. So we have these two different applications. See, as I said earlier in one of my write-ups, that this program was initially was initially set up to cater for you know, the legal practitioners because lawyers can kill and save life with language use. So the language you use will determine your success in any legal suit. So we move to the next topic. That's lexical semantic ambiguities. Lexical semantic ambiguities. That is, sentences containing some words that are capable of two or more interpretations. In this case, not just the structure that is responsible for the ambiguities, but individual words in the sentence. For example, we have uh, something like, I, die, I went and dined with prayers. In this case, you have to look for any word inside that is polysemous. The word that is polysemous is a word that is capable of two or more different interpretations, meanings. So in the expression or in the sentence, I went and dined with prayers. To went and dine with something means to do it regularly. What you are used to do, that's you went and dine with it. So I went and dined with prayers, the first meaning of prayers. A prayer, prayer can be supplication, request you make to God. That's prayer. It's an abstract now, the prayer you offer to God, the request you offer, that's prayer. Another meaning for prayer. So in this case, I want to die with prayers means if we take the meaning to be request we make. So I die, I want to die with prayers means whatever I do, I pray. I always pray. I pray, anything I do, I pray. I want to die with prayers. But another meaning for prayer, thus, Someone who prays is a prayer. He who prays is a prayer. He who speaks is a speaker. He who dances is a dancer. He who talks is a talker. Please, there's a problem there. The talker has a deeper meaning. A talker is somebody who talks too much. So this Word, I fact, I made, I, I learned about it when I was lecturing at the University of Fife, OAU. One of my students corrected my English. I use talkative, that's the adjective of talker. I use talkative as a noun. The student pointed my attention. That's now, sir, talkative is an adjective. The noun is talker. The talker is somebody who is talkative. So we have the ear. Mecca for you know, agent or somebody who does something. So we have somebody who speaks is a speaker. He who dances, who dances is a dancer. Who he walks is a worker. So he who prays is a prayer. Let's take note of that meaning. So in this case, I went and die with prayers means I interact with those who pray. I interact with those who pray. Wherever you see me, most of the time, you see me with those who pray. I went and dined with prayers. I fellowship with them. Let's move to the next topic. 
The next topic is serial monological constructions. Serial monological constructions. In this case, those who are very sound in vocabulary, they be able to, they should be able to use words. They should be able to economize words. We are going to use four or five words. You can use only one. That will stand for the the words in series. So serial construction means constructions that make use of many words. Monolexical constructions constructions that make use of only single words. And if for you to be able to handle the monological aspect, it means you must be very good in vocabulary. So in this case, we want to see just one or two examples. There are two words that are easily confused. People seem not to know the difference. Thus, bring and fetch. Bring is a monological you know, construction. Bring, that's a construction. It's, it's a sentence. Bring. These, the, 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 the words in series, the serial construction of bring is take and come. Take, come. That's bring. That means that thing you have to bring is there with you. You don't need to go for it. Oh, welcome to the class, please. please. You don't need to go for it. That's bring me in the book. You have to take it and come to me. But there's another word, fetch. When you say fetch, you have to go, take, and come. So in fetch, you go, you take it, and you come. So fetch me water. You go for the water. You take the water, you come. So we have go, take, come as that's serial construction. But fetch is the monological construction. So we have many of such, but this is just a kind of introduction. So we also have another topic, very interesting one. We call this situational notions, SM, versus permanent notion. Situational notions are notions that show temporary situations. Things that are not permanent, that is, they can change, they are subject to changes. But permanent notions, things that are always there. Intrinsic values. Intrinsic. Something in it. So let's see the examples here. We have sick and sickly. Sick and sickly, we see that sick is, is a, it's not permanent. It's situational. You may be sick today, tomorrow, and be well. So sick has nothing permanent about it. But sickly has a permanent kind of notion. Permanent, you know, coloration. In the sense that whoever is sickly is sickly. Whoever is sickly must have been born sickly. Those who are sickly are weak. They have weak constitution. If they stretch themselves, they strain themselves much, they fall sick. So sickly is a permanent notion. Why sick? is temporary, situational. So we have another one that's another pair that's beautiful and attractive. Please, just a minute. I'm a coffee man. I take coffee. Mm. So beautiful and attractive. See, attractive is situational. Somebody will be attractive today, tomorrow, no more attractive, not attractive. Attractive, that is, you make yourself attractive to people. People are attracted to you. Maybe you use cosmetics and other things to make yourself appear beautiful, not necessarily beautiful. He who is ugly, no matter the cosmetic camo camouflage he uses, she uses, the ugliness must still fit her true. But attractiveness is not permanent. It can change. No. But beautiful is a permanent notion. 
She who is beautiful is beautiful. Whatever she wears, she, the beauty will be, you know, we, 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 we fit her through. So beautiful is permanent. Why attractive is not. Then we have uh, vice and sin. Vice and sin. Sin is situational. What is a sin in Islam may not be a sin in Christianity. A sin is a thou shall not do something. God said it, you should not do this. Not necessarily bad. So what is not allowed? What is not allowed in a religion, for example, religious practice, is a sin. There's an injunction to that that you should to that effect. But vice is something that is bad, naturally bad. It's naturally bad. Okay. Naturally bad. That's vice. Religiously untenable, right? you just lay front at that sin. But that is bad. Killing, for example, all over the world, everybody knows is bad. That's a vice. So it's permanent. It doesn't change. So we have many others. Let's move on, please. Next topic that's principle of triangular semantic relations. Principle of triangular semantic relations. In this case, we have a triangle. At the apex is a word. Then at the base, there are two words that you know have common common source with the apex typical word. So we have that. Example. Respiration. Respiration is at the apex. That respiration means to breathe. Breathing involves out and in. Breathing in and breathing out. But at the base of the triangle, we have inspiration and expiration. Inspiration means breathing in, while expiration is breathing out. So we have these two, this pair, sharing, having the same common no better with the respiration. That's principle of triangular semantic relations. For example, we are famous. Famous. When you are famous, you are known to many people. A famous wrestler, a famous boxer, famous anything. You are known to many people. So it's not stated at the apex whether you are known for good or for bad. So at the base now of the triangle, we have two words specifying the type of fame, how famous. So we have notorious and popular. If you are known for good, you are popular. If you are known for bad, you are notorious. So famous is at the apex. Known, loosely known, but if the fame is for bad things, you are notorious. If it's for good deeds, you are popular. So we have another one, another pair, another triangular you know, uh, form. That's convince. To convince is to make people do something or not to do something. You can, you can convince somebody to go, or you can convince him not to go. But there are two words at the base that specify this. Convince to do something that's persuade. Convince not to do something is dissuade. So we have persuade and dissuade. Both seem to convince, but persuade means go ahead do it while this way is don't. Rich is another epical word. Rich. Rich. You can have richness derived from rich. 
we also have riches. So richness and riches, they are quite different. They are, I know, they are far apart in many. Richness is derived from rich. Rich, riches also derived from rich. But riches has to do with money, wealth. Riches, that's about money. Somebody having the wealth you have to spend. The last richness refers to quality. For example, this program now, we can talk of the richness. The richness of this lecture. That's the quality, how fine it is. So we have richness and riches, you know, derived from rich. So we have others, but don't let's waste time. This is just the second phase of the introductory lecture. I'm um, so much, I'm, I'm, I'm so much keyed up. So I think we should start first. So the next lecture will be the beginning of the real lecture. Mm -hmm. Lecture per se. So this just into drop. Oh, engineer. Oh, oh yes, sir. Yes. You're alive now. Yes. Yes. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Yes. So uh, let's go to the next topic. To the next topic. Sorry, our engineer. <laughs> yes. To the next topic. There's uh, anomalous adjectives. Anomalous means irregular. Uh, irregular adjectives. That is nouns of unpredictable adjectives. So we have many adjectives. When you see them, you cannot trace them to the nouns. So we have a large number of such in English language. So we need to learn this because if you don't learn it, you cannot associate them with the nouns. So one of them is febrile. Febrile, if you have not heard of febrile in your life, there's no way you can relate it to the noun, fever. Fever is the noun of febrile, fever. You only know of feverish, but this, the real adjective for fever, febrile. Last night, I had a febrile attack. That's, I had fever. So, febrile is an anomalous adjective of fever. We have Luna. Luna, you need to master it, to know it, before you can know the meaning that is for moon. Luna is the adjective of moon. And that's why I keep telling my students all over the place to learn French language, especially French. Many words in English are borrowed from, from French. So if you learn French, you know many things. You don't need to crack your brain. Luna, for example, is from French. Luna is from loon, loon in French. Loon is moon, the moon, that's loon. So luna is the irregular anomalous adjective of moon. When we say somebody is, uh, is a lunatic, a lunatic, that person has some emotional mental problem. When the moon is waxing, particular time, the lunacy, that is the problem we become acute. So from there we have lunatic, from moon, moon. Then we have lunar calendar, lunar calendar, that is calendar based on the uh, phases of the moon and the rest. Similarly, we have terrestrial, which is also from French. Terrestrial is from terre, a terre. A term is earth, earth, planet earth. So terrestrial is of the earth. You need to master that to know it before you can relate it to Earth. It's from French too. We have uh, Celestia. Celestia is also from French as Ciel. Ciel is sky in French. So Celestia, adjective of sky or heaven, like a CCC, Celestial Church of Christ. So we have Astro. Astro is from French. Astre. Astre, that's star. So astra is adjective, irregular, anomalous adjective for a star. There is this expression, distal side. Distal side is not a word, so I can say this word. There are two words already. I can say expression. Distal side is a phrase. So distal side, we have distal. Distal is a tool 
It's a stick used by women in those days for weaving. For weaving. So women made use of they made use of this stuff. This stuff used for weaving. Then we have spear. Spear is a weapon of war. So men use spear on the battlefield. So when we are talking of the mother side, when we are talking of the mother side, this is my uncle from the mother side. So we now use the distaff side. This is my uncle on the distaff side. That is brother to my mother. But if it's brother to my father, this is my uncle on the spear side. So we have that. Sorry, uh, I have uh, I have moved too far, too fast this time. What I'm explaining is denotative antonyms, but we still go back. So to you know, to conclude the anomalous adjective of a thing, we have buckle. Buckle, you no, know, many ballet teachers they say buka. It's not buka. It's buckle. Buckle cavity. That's mouth. In front we have bush. That's the mouth. Buckle cavity. Buckle. Please, when you see a word with double consonant, for you know, preceded by you, the, it's not O, it should be pronounced A. Uh. Buckle. Buckle. It's like butter. B U T T. Gutter. T T. So we have that. Rubber. Rubber. R U B B. Not rubber. So we have that. So, buckle is the eyes of a mouth, like oral. So we move to denotative antonyms. That's where I was trying to explain this stuff side. And specific. That's denotative. Denotative antonyms, that is direct dictionary opposite. Direct dictionary opposite. This is very easy to handle. Because it's just a matter of knowing the meaning of a word, then you know the opposite. So nothing so nothing difficult there. So we have that like a homosexual, therapy is just lesbian. We have a knock need, we have bandy legged, we have vagina, we have phallic, things like that. But the if we now move to the next topic, we are rounding off today in this next topic. They are rounding off, not rounding up. When you say rounding up, it's a different thing. To round up is to surround. The place we round up the house. The house was rounded up by the place, surrounded. But we are rounding off. You are bringing this introductory lecture to a close so that we can start the real lecture very soon. That's starting with the phonology, sound system of English language. English phonology. So this final topic here is connotative antonyms. This is very interesting. I doubt, I doubt if any teacher or lecturer has been has handled this anyway. What people teach is denotative antonyms, direct dictionary, literal opposite. But this we are talking of connotative antonyms, opposite. That is, words that are opposite, not textually, but contextually. Contextual opposite, but textually similar words. We look at the pair. The pair, you know, you see the two words, they appear to be similar. But contextually, in a deeper sense, In a deeper sense, in a deeper sense, they are more or less opposite words. Example, cold, cold and cool, cold and cool. You see that the two are of uh, low temperature. They are of low temperature. 
Yeah, I'll flow temperature. Hmm? Yes, they soon be true. So, cold and cool, they are flow temperature. So, they are textually up, uh, similar when you see them. But when you look deeper, you realize that they are more or less opposite. One is negative, the other is positive. Everybody would love to stay in the cool place. Cool place is a place that is, you know, uh, you love, you love it. You enjoy staying there. Everything is okay for your system. But cold is harsh. Cold weather is harsh, harsh weather. Cool weather is very fine for you when you stay there. Where there is cool weather. Then reception, for example, if there was there's a, a kind of a cold reception, Hostile, people are hostile to you. But everything is cool, very friendly. Then we have childish and childlike. Childish and childlike, they are still derived from child. They appear to be similar words, but they are opposite, contextually. If somebody is childish, he manifests negative traits of a child. No maturity is childish. No maturity, no common sense, nothing, not so that's being childish. But childlike, still manifesting traits of a child, but positive ones. Innocence is part of the traits of a child. Innocence, no forgiving spirit. So no, we have a chastity. So that's childlike and childish. Weaker sex and fair sex. They are, they still refer to women. Weaker sex, first, but weaker, no woman would want to see herself as a weaker sex. But men refer to women as weaker sex. Why women refer to themselves as fair sex? They are fair, they are pretty, they are fine. Similarly, men are considered the sterner sex, sterner sex by women. Whereas men see themselves as the stronger sex. So sterner sex, and the sugar says they are connotative antonyms, but textually similar. Now we have killer and warrior. A killer kills, a warrior also kills. But why a killer pays for killing? A warrior is paid for killing. A warrior is a soldier doing his legitimate business. Why a killer is a criminal? Both of them kill. The same thing we have gunner and gunman. Gunner is somebody who uses gun. A gun also uses gun. But a gunner is a soldier, somebody who serves his country using gun. Whereas a gunman is a criminal who uses gun. We have things that is, but don't let me waste for time. So let's get ourselves ready for the next outing. But I will advise that as we subscribe to this channel, try to like you know, the video, make positive comment, share, share, share. If you share, you bring people, you know, to enjoy what you're enjoying. And don't forget to go access, access our group on Facebook. That's JC Training Concept. You see details about registration and other things, but for information, whoever subscribes to this and inboxes me and uh, shares this is automatically registered. So it's automatic registration for those who register, who subscribe and share our post and make positive comments. Also, those who share, as I said, the post. And not only the registration fee is waived for sharers and subscribers. The tuition fee also will be free for those who are registered you know, on this channel. So thank you very much. We will see more of ourselves, of one another, or rather of each other. Here we have one million people on one side, and only one person on one side. We see each other, facing each other. Because we have two you know, parties. I am a party. All of you, the whole world, are another party. So we will be seeing more of each other. Thank you very much.